And hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Cable. Chapters is the television show that profiles local authors, editors, and publishers in our community. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We're delighted to have author and writer Danny Petrie with us here today. And Danny Petrie was born and raised in Beckley, West Virginia, where he and he's lived in the Huntington area since 2000. Uh, Danny has two degrees, including a Master of Education in Mental Health Counseling from Lindsey Wilson College and a Master of Science degree and recreational therapy from Indiana University in Bloomington, and he has worked as a recreational therapist at a treatment facility since 2002, and we're here to talk about his variety of books, uh, which cover a wide variety and wide range of topics, and we will get to that here in just a moment. But first, Danny, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on Chapters. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks so much for having me. I wanted to ask you first about one of your books, which um, is a neat book that, that you put together called 150 Wonderful Things That You Should Know About West Virginia. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to, to write that book and what was the process like collecting all those factoids about West Virginia. Well, growing up here in the state of West Virginia, I just accumulated a lot of the facts just from living here over the years. And one of the big reasons that I decided to write the book was because the... Um, anniversary of the 150 years of the state's birthday was coming up and I thought well that's a good time to have 150 fa uh, good positive facts about the state. I think with a lot of people from West Virginia we often get a negative stereotype so I thought well this book will reflect you know some of the positive aspects of the state. So how did you go about collecting all of that information? Did, what, what was the research process like? Where did you start? How did you begin getting all that information? Well, um, I just got out some journals and notebooks, and um, I, I broke it down into groups. I'll, um, I'll tell you some of the sections in the book. Let's see. Um, we have symbolism. So I just that's kind of just based on my eighth-grade history. I should, should give a shout-out to my eighth-grade history teacher, Mr. Good in Beckley. <laughs> he taught me those. And my sixth grade uh, teacher, uh, Mr. Sammons, you know, they that's where I learned those things, like the state uh, animal and state colors and those kind of things. Let's see, there's another section on um, just cities and counties in the state. Another section just on interesting facts about the state, colleges and universities. And, and I want to add, you, you told my graduate degrees, but I did go to Marshall University here in Huntington for my undergraduate degree. So... I wanted to be sure that was in there. Um, sports athletes, uh, famous disasters that have happened, politicians in the state, famous people, and just some movies about the state. So that, that's a, that's an interesting collection. When you think about <laughs> you know sociologically and economically and politically, you, you've got it all covered there. Where where did you wh did you find yourself in this process overwhelmed with facts? How did you? go through a process of deciding these were the 150 things I wanted to use? That, that is a good question. Of course, there were a lot of facts, you know, that I found, but I wanted to pick ones that were very interesting that people would say, hey, that's, you know, that's neat. So, of course, some of them had to get left out just to sh shorten it down to 150. And how did you go about publishing this work? Well, I'm a self-published author, which I like to do, and... I go through Amazon, they have a site called Create Space, and anyone who can create a Word document and, and print it into a PDF file can upload their, their books there. And that's the process I've used with all of my books at this time. So you have an, a, a, a variety of different children's books as well that you sort of segued from after you got finished writing the 150 wonderful things you should know about West Virginia. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you made that transition and, and why you started to get into the children's book area in terms of some of the things that you wanted to write about. Well, um, I'll start with my best-selling book is actually, um, it's called Building Character with Sam, Izzy, and many other dogs. And my sister had two pet dogs, a chihuahua and a bulldog, a very unlikely pair. And despite being very different animals, they accepted each other and they were best friends. We'll upload a picture of that for the video too. And I work with children who don't always have the best social skills. They don't have empathy and concern for others. So I'd written building character using pictures, mostly dogs, some cats, to teach social traits like um, accepting people who are different, being able to make a compromise, understanding qualities of 
fairness, equality, just being able to make some friends in life. And it kind of goes back to the old, um, I can't think of his last name, Dale, the author of um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. He said, um, the world's greatest friend is a dog. You know, you can call them a bad name and they're, they're going to be happy to see you anyway. <laughs> And so the whole book is um, just pictures of cute dogs and a few cats. And you mentioned that being your bestseller. What has children's response been to, to that book? Because you mentioned that you work with children uh, who sometimes don't have the best social skills or empathy for others. And yeah. we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. But, you know, everybody, no matter what your personality type is, you know, is drawn to a dog. So <laughs> a Or dogs, plural. Uh, so how, what has been your response what has children's reaction been to that book? Um, they really like the pictures of the cute animals. That's usually what sells it at um, book fairs and things. Is They'll see the cover, like the dogs, and uh, then the parents or either a teacher will say, hey, that's a good idea to teach those traits, and they'll pick it up. But um, I really have noticed the kids, they click when they see the pictures of the animals doing it. They get the ideas. And that book also includes an activity book that people can download. I, I try to include specials like that, so teachers or parents can print it out it's got coloring pictures and word searches and and it asks you questions about the 15 different character traits i should also share uh, the west virginia book also has an online test after you read the book you can go it's just a fun little quiz that you can take and, and test your knowledge after reading the book as well and i think both of those would be good for teachers who want to use those books in the classroom i know a lot of students have a, an accelerated reader program in their school systems or in their individual schools and a test or some kind of activity is required for the student yeah. to complete after the book has been read to show that they have mastered the concept so that would be very good for that so yeah. tell us a little bit more about your other books uh, in addition to to building characters in the west virginia book uh, another book that that you've written that i like and i see it's <laughs> next here on the list is uh, monsters of much fun or monsters Monsters, monsters are so much fun, I should say. Tell us a little bit about that book. Well, um, of course, I got into the making books for children, you know, after the Same and Izzy book. And I have a friend in, from Marshall that was, um, he wasn't my roommate, but down the hallway. And he ended up going on to major in toy design. His name's uh, uh, Derek. And he creates these monster toys. And I said, you know, that would be a good idea for a book. And he's like, I can't create a book. And I said, well, I could create one. So he gave me permission to use pictures of his toy monsters. For him, he can help promote his monsters, but for me, I use um, a lot of different creative activities, you know, where I work with children. Um, the first one, monsters are so much fun. It's about numbers, one to 10. Let's see, there's another one, uh, so many monsters, and it's about descriptive words, you know, describing things. And then, of course, I think this one might be my favorite. It's called, it's not a monster, it's a monster. When I was a child, I was in speech therapy. I hope I'm doing better for this, for television, but I cannot pronounce the constant R sound. I couldn't say the er sound. So I thought, it's not a monster. And every, mon every monster in this book ends with the er sound. Like a vampire, spider. So that, that's a cute book for, um, to prompt kids. I was afraid that creating that book might cause some ridicule for kids who have that problem, but I share it based on my own experiences. My speech therapist in elementary school had a real nice box of toys, and they all ended in the er sound. And then to be able to use that toy, you had to pronounce it. And I was like, I want the taggle. I want the call. <laughs> <laughs> and over time, do you get a star for today? <laughs> over time, I've, I've learned to speak a little better, I hope. Of course, um, my niece's favorite is the monsters, colors, and candy. For each color, it, the, uh, each monster likes a certain color, and that's their favorite candy. And it's got pictures of the monsters with their favorite candies. And then there's one on monster shapes that teaches shapes. So that's the monster book series, and they're pretty popular. I wanted to ask you, too, about the collection of monster books because one of the things that a reader will notice when they pick that up is how richly illustrated they are. Can you tell us about that process? Where did you get the images, and was that difficult when you sat down to put those books together to get the words wrapped around the images? How did that process work for you? Well, um, just my own hobby of using Photoshop is the basic principle. But I just take my own pictures of the... Um, 
of the toy monsters and then just if you take it on a back on a white background and then just edit that out and I just use Microsoft Word for um for the written part and I use like word art and just put the words over you can click on them like to float over graphics so um now the covers I do spend a little more time on to to get a more um attractive cover that'll get people's attention so from the time you get an idea to do one of those books if it's the monster series or something else from the time you get the idea until the time that you've got a copy that you're ready to send off for publication, how long does it take and how do you do it? Do you work on it each day? Does it stop and go for you uh, depending on how your work schedule goes? How, how does it all come together in terms of a timeline? Well, um, I do it in my leisure time. You know, um, I know some people go out fishing or hunting like my father for hobbies. Whenever I have spare time, I'm usually writing or reading books. And I find that once I get an idea, I've just got to make it come to reality um i think everything there's two of everything in the world such as the um take the golden gate bridge or even the um bridge in west virginia at first it was in somebody's mind it was an idea and then it had to be created so once i get an idea i de it's mostly persistence of just keep working until it's completed and some of these smaller books i probably wrote in a week i, I got the idea and as soon as I had some time to write down in my journal some ideas, you know, I jot it all out. So I think that's the biggest hint or tip for writers if they have an idea to create it. You mentioned that uh, you do spend a lot of time, uh, when you're not writing, working with children. How did you get involved in working with children, and what are some of the things you enjoy most about working with kids? Well, when I did my undergraduate work at Marshall, my goal, I was going to work with senior citizens, maybe at a nursing home doing activities. And I applied for jobs in both Virginia, West Virginia and Virginia, both Carolinas. And I got a job here in Huntington. And, and the supervisor said, do you have any experience working with kids? Well, I was 21, maybe 22. At the time, I thought it was the right answer. I said, well, I was just a teenager a while back. You know, I'm practically a kid still. Now that I'm older and more wiser, I realize that might not have been the best answer. They said, well, great. You know, and they gave me a job part-time at first, and um, I've just stayed with the job ever since. And working with children is an alternative to working with geriatrics. And I find a lot of passion helping the kids. It's, it's really meaningful work. What do you see about the connection that children have with reading? And, and we hear so much... Uh, from other children's writers that we've had on the program talk about how it's so important to get kids to uh, appreciate reading, appreciate books, appreciate sort of that entire process when they're young. Um, what are your thoughts on that, and and how do you get kids interested in reading? Uh, if it's not, you know, one of your monster books that they're interested in, how do you get kids to, to see that as a valuable, worthwhile activity? Well, I have several nieces and um, a nephew and a nephew on the way, so... One thing I do every month is I, I buy them a children's book. And I think just having books in front of them, you know, and if it's things they're interested in, you know, for my nephew Gage, if it's things like Spider-Man or he's interested in plants and zombies, you know, these kid video games, something to get them off, to get kids off the electronics because I think the younger generation, they do that a lot. And so I constantly buy them all books. I'm not sure on the facts, but I think, you know, children houses with children that don't have age-appropriate books that don't have any children books they're just not going to have the access to just pick up one and start reading so I, I definitely think getting children interested in books by just having a, a lot of books for them and I have, think it's very important yeah and having them kind of gravitate towards it when they when they see it there very good you mentioned that uh, you're an avid reader yourself uh, who are some of the authors that you read what are some of the genres that you like to read uh, as an individual and as a writer yourself well, I like, I read a lot of self-improvement books. You know, if you go through all, all those, um, uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Uh, let's see. Of course, we're here in the uh, younger adult novels. Of course, I like all those. Um, Susan Collins' Hunger Games series, I've read it. Um, I'm kind of going blank at the moment, <laughs> I guess. Let's see. Uh, we'll just go down the list of some books. Of course, 
uh, Mr. Elliot Parker's <laughs> books. Oh, here. thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I've I appreciate got several that. of your books. <laughs> I appreciate that. Appreciate that very much. Is there a certain genre that you that you like? You mentioned the Suzanne Collins Hunger Games yeah. trilogy, which is kind of a science fiction fantasy esque type of, of story. Is that a genre you gravitate towards, or do you read other things? Uh, mostly uh, the dystopian end of the world. Any of those kind of books, I really, I seem to get hooked on those. And I know that you uh, you have another book that you've uh, brought with us that you're working on, and at the time of this taping, somewhat timely with uh, Halloween coming up uh, and coming around really every year, and this is a Halloween activities book. Tell us yes. a little bit about this book and how it came together and what's inside there. Um, my younger brother, I say younger, he's in his 30s, his favorite holiday is Halloween. He starts celebrating in his September birthday, and every year he dresses up. So this book was kind of a dedication for him. But teachers can use it. It's got all the activities are legally reproducible for classrooms, and it's got word searches, crosswords, uh, doodling activities, storytelling activities, just to uh, prompt some creativity. And it's it's a fun book. <laughs> excellent, excellent, very good. Uh, you already gave uh, some advice to folks who were interested in writing earlier when you were talking about persistence. Um, Anything else that you would want to point out to a writer, someone who's interested in writing children's books, writing uh, a facts book like you did about the 150 interesting things about West Virginia, or any other kind of uh, a book that they may be interested in, or short story or poem or whatever they're working on, any other advice you would give them uh, aside from persistence that you found helpful to you as a writer? I would say definitely um, reading a lot of books. You know, you kind of get an idea for a feel of how a book goes and uh, one of my favorite books, it's not necessarily on writing, it's on creativity. It's called uh, The War of Art, not to be confused with The Art of War. Th this is called The War of Art, and I'm going blank on the author's name. I don't, it'll pop in at my mind, but it's um, kind of breaking through your battles of um, your inner battle that tells you stop, be lazy, and you fight it with persistence. So that's um, probably my favorite book on writing. Again, it's called The War of Art. The War of Art. Very good. get a chance, check that out. Oh, Pressfield's the name. Stephen Pressfield. Stephen Pressfield, yes. I, I'm, I'm familiar with him. I've heard that name pop up. Uh, oh, he's also the... He had written a golf movie, and I cannot think of what it's called either. The Legend of Bagger Vance? Yeah, is The that, Legend of Bagger Vance. Is that right. pronounced right? Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't read it, but I do know he had written that. Yeah. And folks interested in checking that out, there's also, I think, a movie was made of that yeah. with... Uh, with uh, Matt Damon and, and uh, Will Smith, I believe, was in that movie uh, in that movie as well. So what are some things that you're working on currently? What are some projects that you have uh, either in, in the pipeline in terms of the drafting stage or maybe some ideas that have been percolating in your mind that you're thinking about working on? I'm thinking, well, I am currently working with a local photographer. We're creating a book about Huntington, and it's going to be um, Huntington today and just the cool places to, to stop in to town. So it'll be more of a local book, and I hope to have it here at Empire Books sometime next year. That's great. So, what has that process been like? How's that been? How did you find the uh, How did you find the photographer? And how did you uh, determine that that's somebody you wanted to work with? Is this somebody you had known previously or worked with previously? I had met this person uh, through the internet. One of my friends on Facebook, uh, a coworker, had some photos done, and I said, "You know, that, those are good photos," and. Um, she told me, well, look at this person's um, photos of just things here in Huntington. His name's, um, well, I won't reveal his name yet until we get the book completed, but I thought, man, you, you do really good. And I thought if I could just write, I'm going to stop by local businesses and get information and just write a short you know, thing on each business. And it's mostly going to be a photography book, a coffee table, fine edition book for the Huntington area. Very good. So... Is this one of those things in terms of organizing a project like that where you all have already predetermined the places that you're going to look, or is he just going to take pictures and you're going to go find uh, businesses and then you're going to kind of meet and strategize? A little strategize? bit of both. I've created a list of um, places that I think mostly in Huntington, but it is the tri-state area. Um, it stretches out to like Cannon Park and Alston's Ice Cream. Very good. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you've had a lot of success using Create Space and using Amazon to help publish your books. Uh, any advice you would give to folks who maybe are a little further along in their writing project and they feel like they've got something ready to go to press yeah. or got something to consider uh, for publication? Any any guidelines, tips, or advice you'd give them in terms of of, of going that route? Were there other areas that you tried publishing aside from from Amazon that? Uh, uh, 
maybe didn't go well for you or went well for you before you settled on Amazon? Well, there, there were some other um, online places, and I regret to say I can't think of their names right off, that you can self-publish. But what I like about CreateSpace is they don't have any upfront cost. So um, I think if a publishing companies, they might say, hey, we'll publish your book for $10,000 or even $1,000. I would recommend not to do that. I do have a little guide on um, self-publishing tips that um, it might be a dollar, it might be free on Amazon that people can download. And that, that's my biggest thing is, you know, don't fall for one of those tricks that if they say we'll publish your book when you can go to Create Space and just upload a book for free. There's other places too. So that's my big advice. Don't spend a whole bunch of money. And of course, get people to read your book that will give honest criticism. A family member will say, oh, this is great. And they might not point out a typo because they don't want to hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. So I try to avoid... Um, Sometimes I'll get my family members to read, but a lot of times, you know, they don't want to hurt your feelings. So they're going to say, this this is the best book I've ever read. <laughs> and so, so it's good to sort of broaden out that circle of, of readers yeah. that can give you some honest feedback. Very good. And another thing with books, too, I like is um, if you're going to write a book, you got to also think of the audience. You know, same with products. If nobody's going to buy a product, it usually doesn't get created. So with Create Space, I try to think of, would someone buy this book? even if it's just for personal enjoyment. Excellent, excellent. Well, in our final moments here with you, Danny, if uh, one of our audience members wants to get in contact with you uh, to talk about writing, to talk about the books that you've written already, or wants to get in contact with you uh, to talk about anything going on uh, in your writing life, uh, where, first of all, where can they get a copies of your books, and then how can they get in contact with you personally? Well, they can... Um Right here at Empire Books, we have um, several of these books available, and if not, Empire Books can get it. And of course, Amazon.com is a good place. Um, books a Million has a few books, but not all of them. And to get in contact with me, um, I respond to almost every email. Just my personal emails, Danny at DannyPetri.com. Feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you. I'd appreciate it. Great. Well, Danny, we appreciate you bringing on not only your Halloween activities book, but your monster series of books. <laughs> We've enjoyed that, and also the 150 interesting facts about West Virginia that you put together. Uh, we appreciate that, and we appreciate you coming on Chapters today to talk about those books, and uh, we wish you all the best of success uh, in your writing endeavors in the future. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it a lot. Sure. And finally, we want to give a thanks to the staff and management at Empire Books and News here at Pullman Square in Huntington for providing our studio taping space today. And we encourage you to stop by Empire Books and News to pick up copies of Danny Petrie's books or any other books that you're looking for to satisfy your reading taste. And we also want to point out that Empire Books and News has the largest selection of magazines in the tri-state. So if you don't like books or you don't like poetry or plays, but you like magazines, Empire Books and News is the place to be. So stop by, say hi to Charlotte and her staff, and let them take care of you for whatever your reading needs might be right here at Empire Books and News. And also, if you have a question, comment, or story suggestion about this chapter's program or any chapter's program that you've seen on Armstrong Cable, we want to hear from you. You can send us an email to the address right here at the bottom of the screen. It is LP4, letter L, letter P, number 4, at zoominternet.net. So please keep those comments and feedback coming. We certainly appreciate all the comments and the responses that we get from you right here to the show. And if by chance you've missed a previous episode of Chapters or you want to go back and watch another episode that you've seen previously, you can check out the Chapters Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube. All you need to do is go to youtube.com, www.youtube.com, backslash Armstrong One Wire. That's all one word. Look for the chapters tab, and there we have over nine hours of author interviews, publisher interviews, and editor interviews from all kinds of talented individuals located here in the West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky tri-state region. So if you've missed something or you want to go back and watch another uh, program uh, on chapters, we encourage you to check out uh, the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube, and you can see that address at the bottom of the screen as well. Well, that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community.